So, hello everyone, I think we will get going uh, and I hope that the sound quality is alright. It's always a bit scary when you jump online. You never know if your, your, um, your people are able, able to hear you or not. Now also my slides started showing, but that's what happens when you go live sometimes as well. I now uh, hear myself as well because I checked my <laughs> sound <laughs> through my phone. But I am Johannes and we're two minutes into this uh, webinar already and I, I, uh, I'm happy to, to see you all here and I'm happy for the like, thank you very much. Uh, and most of you might know me, but for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Johannes and I work as a, a people management consultant on my, in a firm that I co-founded together with a couple of others called The Talent Company. I use their slides now, but I do it as more or less or a private person. I think this is a fun topic. I think it's fun to do webinars and I think it's fun to do sessions like this. So that's why I'm doing it as well. Um, and yeah, if you want to know more about, about me, you can check out my LinkedIn page, obviously, and you can also reach out afterwards as well, should you want to know in detail more specifically about me. But that's not why we're here today. We're here to talk about all the buzzwords that you saw in the invite, you, NFTs, Web 3.0, uh, DAOs, whatnot. We, and let's take it from the top. And I, I, I will sort of paint a picture, hopefully for you, uh, about what this is and then also what it will mean for HR. So first, I'm going to try to explain all the acronyms uh, that you've been hearing about. And then after that, uh, hopefully I'll talk about what this will mean for HR. And it's a disclaimer here. And the big disclaimer is that this is obviously my view and my view won't be necessarily right. So, so it might be that my view uh, conflicts with uh, what other people are saying or it's just my interpretation of all of this. And it's an unknown territory. Like there are literally almost no one else talking about this from an HR viewpoint. So it's, it's my interpretation and it might be completely wrong. Who knows? But hopefully you'll walk away from this webinar feeling that, hey, I know a thing or two about these acronyms and, and how the future uh, landscape of Web 3.0 is looking. So that's that's my aim. That's the, the sole aim. And if you want to comment, if you have any questions, I have that on my screen here. I can see your comments, hopefully. Uh, if not, I don't know what to do, but hopefully uh, I can see the comments on here. So if you have any questions, I mean, feel free to, to pop them in the, in the comment section and I'll do my best, as I said, to answer them as well. Okay, with all this said, let's dive into it. So let's start with a sort of brief history lesson. So in order to explain Web 3.0, we need to know where we're coming from. And we start with Web 1.0 or 1.0, the, the first iteration of the web. And for you, those of you who are as old as me or older, you probably remember Web uh, Web 1. It, it was the, you know, when everything was new with the web, uh, everything was fantastic. You could access everything you wanted, but at least you had that feeling. There was a lot of turning GIFs uh, and it was a hypertext web. And what is a hypertext web? It's, it's more or less that it was more or less only text. It, it was you, need, you needed to know HTML uh, to create it so the html is the programming language that you use still use to program uh, web pages but you you needed to know that you needed to be sort of a programmer almost to put stuff up on the web and it was very very basic web pages like if you remember them back in the days like alta vista and yahoo and in sweden we had passage and and, and whatnot but it was only read web. You, you could only sort of, you could do very, very little interaction besides like the chats that were also popping up, but you could, it was hard to publish and it was read more or less only. So that was the first iteration. And then we have the second iteration, which I mean, you're watching this on YouTube and YouTube is a prime example of web 2.0. So it's what we call the social web. So the social web, obviously you can interact, you can read and write, you could participate in the web in a whole other sort of, on a whole other level compared to the first iteration of the web. And it's centralized. So there's a few central players and you probably know them by heart. We have Facebook, we have Google, we have YouTube, uh, we have LinkedIn, but it's all uh, sort of congested to one or, or two players in an area. So we need to go to that place and we, we, we can't obviously we, we can own them through to buying stocks in these companies, but we can't really own them in sense of 
uh, that we are participating other than that we submit our content to these platforms and these platforms uh, they sort of utilize what we contribute and what we share uh, to to increase the revenues i mean me sending this on youtube is a is once again a prime example so i commit uh, stuff up to youtube and youtube monetize that one way or another through ads or through um, uh, subscriptions uh, but they keep the revenue uh, to a large extent like i don't see any revenue from this for example so so youtube utilizes me as sort of a creator if you whatever you want to call it and they monetize that um, and uh, totally fine i mean that was the premise that web 2.0 was built on uh, it focuses a lot of communities building communities i mean facebook is is one of the sort of most used example when it comes to explaining web 2.0 that uh, that we all sort of it was an interconnected web like the truly interconnected we could connect to to anyone and we could talk to anyone uh, so that is web 2.0 and then we have web 3.0 then and why do we even need to explain this why why, why am i talking about web 3.0 at all because that's sort of the rest that we're going to talk about that's sort of you can say that web 3.0 is spanning across all the rest of the, that we're going to talk about and it's important to you to understand sort of the concept behind web 3.0 even though it can be it's even hard to explain to some extent because there are so many sort of different variations of what people put into web 3.0 but a general sort of feeling or a general uh, accepted way of explaining is it's is this semantic web and what is a semantic web that it's it, it's intertwined to to a whole other level it's decentralized so it's it's not one central player owning it it's not built by one company which everything has to be routed through so in order to be decentralized obviously you need several different nodes so it's no clear ownership uh, in the same sense that it used to be with web 2.0 so so it's decentralized in a whole other way and one could like there if you go uh, and look this up on web there are tons of like arguments and uh, discussions around is it really decentralized or is it just partly decentralized or is it even you know still centralized uh, that uh, some key players are still sort of betting heavily on moving into this web 3.0 and do they then become centralized player in sort of a decentralized fashion so so there's a lot of different sort of discussions going on through throughout the community around this but but it's quite generally accepted that that web 3.0 the definition of it is that that it, it is de decentralized and and we will talk about blockchain because blockchain is hugely decentralized and also one of the sort of main key factors of building the web uh, the 3.0 uh, web and it's to a larger extent user owned so i mean it's not that every user like every participation or participant across the web is is owning part of this but but you can as a individual to a larger extent own the the platforms that you do, you, you participate in so it's more uh, instead of having youtube as an example that would, would be that if I, as a creator, submit something up to a Web 3.0 similar platform, so if I were to send this on a Web 3.0 uh, platform, uh, I would get either sort of some incentive back, like in terms of cash, or I would get a part ownership of the platform that I'm using. But it's all built around, or most of the um, functions deemed as Web 3.0 uh, platforms or, or functions, they are built on the premises that the user who sort of actively brings value to the platform that, that they are using, they get something in reward, um, uh, a reward back, some kind of incentive back. And and I, I think, I mean, that's also why a lot of people like this now, because it's, it's bringing the sort of feeling of, I can be part of co-creating this and I can be part of it in a whole other level than compared to Facebook, for example. And then we also have, and it's important to emphasize that, a lot of people say that hey, it's just a buzzword. Nothing is really changing. It's just a buzzword. People throw it around, and and nothing is really changing. It's still centralized. It's still, as mentioned, like huge players investing in this, and there will be no change. So, and and I'm I'm I haven't fully landed myself on where I actually stand. I think it's partly true that it's it's something new, uh, but it's also partly true that, I mean, Facebook won't give up. Uh, their sort of share of the web easily like they will probably participate somewhere or another and then 
how, where do we land then and how, what will it be sort of where will we land in this new world but that there's a shift happening that's for sure i mean we see all of this happening like in, in real time and it's starting especially within the finance sector so we talk about something called DeFi, which is then decentralized finance for example which to a larger extent is is much more user owned and, and, and user generated than ever before so i'm landing in somewhere in the middle as usual like it's happening it's worth keeping an eye on and hopefully you know also now what people are talking about when they say oh it's a web 3.0 thing or it's a i'm building web 3.0 stuff uh, which is not uncommon now if you look at engineers for example they talk a lot about web 3.0 stuff and building that so that's that's the web 3.0 and as i said it's it's more of an umbrella that over sort of that shadows everything i'm going to talk about now today uh, but I, I wanted to start there and just mention that, hey, this is the umbrella I'm going to talk about. This is the, the overarching principle of, of uh, these functions that I'm not going to talk about. They all fit under the umbrella, Web 3.0. So you have that with you as well. And then it's, it's almost impossible. I, I mean, I mentioned it already. It's almost impossible not to talk about Web 3.0 and the things we're going to talk about without mentioning blockchain. And you probably heard about blockchains in various forms. Like it's almost impossible not to hear about blockchain one way or another. And usually when we talk about a blockchain, we talk about Bitcoin uh, or at least the press talks about Bitcoin. So if you've been reading about all these like Bitcoin millionaires or uh, people are now <laughs> shifting out bit uh, their gold reserves or countries are shifting out their gold reserves for, for Bitcoins. Uh, it's, it's almost as uh, a blockchain is sort of... Um, uh, if you talk about blockchain, you talk about Bitcoin. Uh, but there are several others uh, that are sort of deemed as blockchains as well. And Bitcoin is for sure the most known one and, and also the biggest one to a large extent. But we have, for example, Ethereum, uh, which is also a huge uh, blockchain, which a lot of functions run on. Uh, and, and what you can sort of describe it, and I'll, I'll try to describe what it is, uh, as a decentralized database holding information. But it's important to know that blockchain is... is it's, it, it's a technology, it's not blockchain and Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a blockchain, but blockchain isn't Bitcoin, if that makes sense. So it's, it's important to separate those two. Or separate, but at least make the distinction between the two, that they are not uh, totally the same. Uh, blockchain is, is a technique and Bitcoin is a blockchain, uh, sort of. And I'm going to uh, go out on a limb here and try to explain this. Uh, what, what is a blockchain? And now you'll, you'll see like it's a, it's a Bitcoin example here as well. But as I said, most bl uh, blockchains there and there are tons of blockchains. Uh, they run on the more or less the same principle. So a transaction is requested and auth authenticated saying like I, I want to do something. I want to send someone money. And the block uh, uh, representing that transaction is created. So you can see it as an envelope. So I say, I want, uh, I want to send money to, to a friend. Uh, and, and then the envelope sort of where I put that note in becomes the block. And then the block is sent to everyone. Like instead of just sending it to my friend, the block is sent to all one, uh, all participating sort of computers or participating friends saying, uh, hey, hey the, Johannes wants to send someone money. And then every, you can say that every friend I have, they keep, a tr they keep for some various reasons, they keep track of how much money I have. Uh, so so they, they look at the, their inventory saying, okay, Johannes wants to send 100 crowns. Does he have 100 crowns? Yes, he have. So they validate that transaction. And for the work that they put in, so for the work that they say like, oh, um, Johannes wants to send 100 crowns and I validated, yeah, he has 100 crowns. So now he can give Pelle his 100 crowns. For the, for, the, for the time that they spent looking up that, hey, he actually has that money, they receive a small award. So I have to pay sort of a, what we call then a gas fee, or you think of it as a fee for them validating that. And then they get that reward back. And then they also add, to their ledgers like hey uh, Johannes has now a hundred crones less but Pelle has a hundred crones more so all update their sort of ledgers over what uh, what we have essentially and and uh, it might be for some networks there's only like say let's say you have a hundred people participating in this it might be that it 
it's only enough if 20 do it, like 20 needs to verify the transaction. And then it, that is updated to the rest of the AT should that happen. And then Pella gets his money. Uh, and as I said, like I'm, I'm not an engineer and I'm not, I'm not a, a Bitcoin expert either, but this is how I've got it explained to me. And I think that's, I know it's a simplified version. Obviously there's a lot more to it. But that is essentially how a blockchain works. So you can think of it as it's it's very tamper proof. Uh, and and usually what you do is you check all ledgers. You check that everyone is. If I ha say I have a hundred crones, it's really checked that I actually have a hundred crones, and it's validated over and over again. Uh, and obviously when you hear about blockchain taking or Bitcoin taking up so much, and you, it's just because obviously every time a, a request for a transaction comes in, it needs to be checked, and that uh, consumes energy. Uh, and people are working constantly also to improving this because that's one of the most common things you hear about Bitcoin and blockchain these days that, hey, it's really, really bad for the environment, which to some extent is true. But I mean, people are working intensely of, of trying to fix this as well uh, to make sure it's environment friendly and also sustainable in the long term. And uh, what what is also good to know about this is it, it's, as I said, it's very tamper proof. It's really hard to tamper with the ledger because you you need them to hack all the computers for example or you need to convince the rest of the computers that hey now a shift has changed in the ledger and that requires a tremendous amount of, of uh, computing power so so i mean it's it's a very safe uh, way of doing uh, business and one also one common thing that you hear about blockchain is that oh it's just for criminals but that's actually not true like if you can connect someone to a specific account which police have done in, in in quite recently like if you can connect someone to that i mean it's all open like if you have sort of your address uh, publicly open if, if that got sort of in the in the wrong hands everyone could see exactly how much money you are you have and all the transactions you've made so yes it used to be perhaps used by criminals but it's it's a very small use case these days uh, i would say for for most parts there are various other problems as well with Bitcoin, so that just, just uh, then we could talk about Bitcoin the rest of this session as well. So I hope that made sense and it was at least a simplified version of, of blockchain uh, that you've uh, seen. And going through uh, then what we're going to talk about, like NFTs is the next thing we're going to talk about. and and. Uh, now we talked about Web3, uh, which then is an overarching thing. We, we talked about blockchain, which is running NF, uh, which is running Web3 to a large extent. And one thing that is dependent on blockchain is NFTs. And NFTs, you probably heard about this as well. It's, it's hard not to hear about it. It's been in the press a lot the last years. It really took off a year ago or so, I would say, where people started investing a lot in NFTs or buying a lot of NFTs. But what is an NFT? So NFT stands for non-fungible token. So the non-fungible part is that it's unique and valuable. A fungible thing is, is a dollar, for example. If, if, if you and I have a dollar and we switch them, like we still have a dollar, there's no like uniqueness to that. A dollar is a dollar. It's worth a dollar. But if I have a painting and you have a painting, and we switch paintings i mean most likely your painting will be will be a lot more valuable than my crappy painting and that is something that it's non-fungible it's, it's unique it has its own value and the token part of this is is think of it as a certificate so it's a like when you buy a, a watch you you get a certificate saying like hey this is really a rolex it was made by yada yada it has this serial number uh, and and sort of we approve the authenticity of, of this watch. So it's, it's really a token that says like, hey, this is unique, it's yours, uh, and, and, or perhaps not yours, but it, it's unique at, at least, and we validate it that it's, it's really unique. So that is uh, a token. So NFTs then become sort of unique, um, unique assets that are sort of validated by a token. And that, that token is, is validated through blockchain. So, I mean, in order to shift the NFT, you need to to uh, to send it like you send the envelope I talked about with the money. Like, you need to to very uh, verify that hey, this is really Johannes' uh, piece of art, for example, and he can send it to someone who's on the other end of the receiving part. And when I when I send that, then it runs through the whole blockchain, validating that hey, you actually own that as well. And there's a lot of uh, talks about 
it's obviously done mostly digital art that is uh, has been produced by this there's been other cases as well but in most cases there have been digital art that that is sold through this sort of mechanism and there's been talks about oh but it's really a you know it's just an image you can screenshot that and then you have your own nft all of a sudden but i mean the same goes with art it's it's not the i mean i can buy a, a print of a monet painting for a hundred crowns that doesn't mean i have a monet and it's what we attribute to that and and i mean as with all sort of these rarities uh, i mean it's it's own i mean the painting itself is not valuable. The, the, the canvas it's painted on, is that's not super valuable. It's what we attribute to that canvas that makes it valuable. And the same goes with NFTs. I mean, it's what we attribute to those. And you can argue that it's insane that we attribute that uh, sort of amount of money to, to digital stuff. But, but, I mean, if you were an alien coming down to Earth and you see like, hey, people are buying this uh, piece of paper with paint on for insane amounts of money i mean the same logic could be applied to art in general at least in my view so i mean it's it is what it is and and it's all sort of in our heads we attribute stuff to st to certain artifacts and those get valuable um but um the important part to remember here is is, is the i think it's the token part like it's it you need it needs to be validated you you that's a certificate that you own sort of the the master or the original or whatever and that's what makes it valuable as well the non-fungible part i mean you can always yeah you can always reproduce whatever you want to reproduce but if it's if you don't have that certificate that says that hey this is an original and it's yours then it's it's, it's really useless uh, if you try to sell it for example so that is nfts and as I said, like it's been a lot about NFTs in the press lately, uh, and and yeah, uh, one could argue a lot around the actual value. And there's crap NFTs. Like it's 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 really high valuable NFTs. Or there's valuable uh, non not so valuable NFTs, and everyone can basically create it. I think it costs like fifty bucks, and then you're ready to go uh, to sell the stuff, for example, on on these platforms that offer NFTs. So it's a really low threshold and potentially then high value if you are an, a known artist or if you're uh, yeah if you can sell uh, your goods uh, for, a, for a decently high price at least so that's nfts and then in the invite we also talked about DAOs and <laughs> what is a DAO then a lot of acronyms now uh, but DAO stands for decentralized autonomous organization and the simplest way I can sort of try to articulate what a DAO is, it's, it's a member-owned communities without central leadership. So it's basically a bunch of people that say like, hey, we want to solve a certain goal, we want to so solve a certain thing, and they come together and, and they organize in then what's called a DAO. And it's mostly done uh, totally digital, like you never meet these people that you work with. Uh, if you look at where sort of the discussions are happening, they're mainly happening on Discord, which is a chat tool. You can sort of compare it to Teams or Slack, but more a, a bit more uh, geeky or nerdy, uh, one might say. And uh, it's a safe way, and I say that with sort of exclamation marks, but it's a safe way to collaborate with, uh, with internet strangers because these DAOs, they also run on smart contracts and smart contracts uh, that equals blockchains. So what people usually do when they start a DAO is that they set a certain uh, set of rules. For example, that if you participate in submitting code or if you're participating on doing uh, marketing activities on Twitter, you, you get rewarded, you get some kind of incentive. Could be that you get more tokens to vote on the things that is happening in the DAO or that you get a, a cash incentive, could be various things as well. But what you usually do is that you set these smart contracts uh, sort of very clearly uh, in the beginning. And there are plenty of services where you can sort of get going with your own DAO. I wouldn't say from sort of off the ground, but people are working quite hard as well on making it easier and easier to form and uh, organize these DAOs as well. So, I mean, if you look back a year ago, that you needed to do a lot of coding to get the DAO up and running. But now it's, I wouldn't say it's just like buying off the shelf, but it's, it's l way uh, less coding needed 
today when, when forming a DAO, if you choose these sort of predefined packages that you can use to set up smart contracts, to set the rules for the DAO and, and how to vote and stuff like that uh, as well. Because it's, it's, it's really a d democracy to some extent, like every member has a voting right. And I said, you can, you can play around with how you vote and what you vote on in that uh, sense that sort of key members can have sort of a higher voting impact, just like in a, in a, a regular organization, but, um, uh, or you can just distribute fairly among among uh, members, and that's that's up to the sort of the forming committee. Which once again you can argue around like, is it really then decentralized if you have this forming committee or if you have forming members? But I mean the whole idea around it is to that you get rewarded for what you actually contribute into the organization. So it's, it's a very clear sort of um, clear goals that need to be met in order to be rewarded. So that is a DAO. And I'll talk a bit more about it as well in, uh, later on, because now we'll talk about what, what, what will this mean for HR? And once again, disclaimer here, like this is my interpretation. It's, it's really my interpretation. Uh, and and uh, there's all there is to it. Like I said, this is an area where people are still debating on, on the definitions of these uh, types of things almost. And, and, and the, the landscape is moving quite fast as well. So there's new incentives and uh, or initiatives popping up all the time. Um, so, so it's my interpretation and you have to take it for what it is. You don't have to agree with it and you can think I'm crazy, it's fine. And, and the first thing, if you roll back, I think it's uh, NFTs as a new form of incentives. I think that's the first thing that we will start see happening. We already seen it happening actually, but that NFTs become a way to incentivize people uh, when working in, not in Web3.0 companies, but in companies in general. So instead of giving people a gold watch or giving people some kind of acknowledgement in the end of the day, you could give them an NFT instead saying like, hey, this is a unique thing. We, um, we created it for this specific event or for this specific uh, time of the year or whatever it might be. And you get rewarded by that. It's unique. It's yours. And, and you can sell it if you want to or you could keep it in your inventory as well. It's, it's up to you to decide. But use them sort of as a way of showing like, hey, you've been here a long time or... You've been uh, really helping out in this crucial project. Hey, here's a, a badge or almost like a badge of honor saying like, hey, you could, you could utilize that. And I mean, people collect and trade all kind of various stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's not uncommon uh, for things like that to happen, but it's perhaps a bit of new, a, a, a new mindset for organizations to think like this. But once again, if we are now then even more digital, if we were, have more people working from home, if we have more people who are distributed across the globe that we perhaps not even meet on a regular basis, like face to face, but we meet digitally, why not then look at rewards that are digital as well and incentivize people that way? Uh, and this is one example. This is a company called Nuri. Um, they're once again a finance uh, DeFi uh, company, so they are a Web3.0 company. And when they shifted names last year, they decided to give out this that you see in, in, in behind me here, hopefully, uh, the uh, Nuri badges. So for saying like, hey, you were part of this project, you were part of this shift, here's a NFT, you can do whatever you want with it, you can keep it just as a, um, uh, what do you say, like a memorabilia for, for yourself or you can sell it. And, and they actually provided the ability to do that. So if you wanted special ones, or if you wanted uh, to be the first one to own a Nuri uh, for whatever reason, you could actually sell them and, and trade these. And obviously, once again, it's super early. I mean, th this is, I, I think it was more of an experiment uh, from their end. And I mean, there's tons of uncertainties around this as well. How do you treat this like, how do you tax such thing? How do you, is it even possible to give it away? Or like, how, how, how will we, we do this? So, I mean, it's not a straight line just giving out NFTs, but I think it's something we might start seeing. And it could also replace options NFTs. So instead of uh, getting options when you start, if you start in a startup, instead of giving away options, you could offer NFTs as like, hey, the first hundred who joins, they get an NFT and we will think they will increase in value and they will be sort of valuable uh, later, uh, long, uh, right, later down the road. Could be an option as well, <laughs> option for options. No, but I, I think it could be uh, a thing we see as well, that the first 
uh, people who join they get an ID for hey you you were part of the early early stages and who knows it, it might be valuable might not be valuable but I think it might be something that we will see and one more example of an NFT as well uh, this is the car maker Neo and they used to give out pins that you like physical pins like hey you've been here a year this is the yearly pin uh, and and yeah here you go so what they did instead last year was that, and you see it says hello Norway there because they entered Norway last year. Uh, what they did was uh, they did NFTs instead of pins. So they gave every employee uh, an NFT and it was sort of a, like a lottery because there are various sort of, there were a few that were super sort of exclusive, one or two that only one or two people got. And then there was a sort of falling line where everyone got something, but you could yeah, you could get the chance to get a super exclusive or or more or less a commodity thing as well. Once again, not saying that this is right, just showing that, hey, this is what they did. It's also interesting, like a side note, is, is that it's interesting that this is China because China is also now coming down quite hard on blockchain or blockchains in general. So we'll see how that evolves in the future. And I should also add that Nuri is a, a European company as well. It's not, it's not a Chinese company or an American company. It's a European company. And then we have DAOs. So how will DAOs impact the future of work? And I think that's perhaps, that is not so far out in the distance. I mean, we see DAOs happening already now to quite a large extent. So once again, it's all about bringing people together, working towards a quite, I wouldn't say simple goal, but it's usually quite clearly defined goal. Uh, and making them people sort of row in the right direction, perhaps a bit overly literally <laughs> with, the, with the picture, but but it's it's more or less making people coming together, aim for a, a defined goal uh, that the DAO is trying to solve one way or another. And I said like it, it can be quite complex problems as well, but usually they are a bit more tangible and I wouldn't say easy, but but easier to to solve. And perhaps the most prime example of, of a DAO, and I think it's it's uh, if you if you if you are an avid reader of Full Stack HR, which I write the newsletter I write, uh, you've heard me talk about this as well before. But Constitution DAO was something I was part of uh, last December, and uh, we set out aim to buy the buy one copy of the U.S. Constitution. And just in a, in a week, we raised forty seven million uh, U.S. dollars, uh, and it was really. Uh, it was fascinating to watch because it started out with nothing and I got thrown into it. I, 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 I did nothing, I should say. Like I just watched and just did memes and, and high fives. But, but just to be part of it and see it sort of come to life. When I joined, we were roughly, I think, 200 people perhaps that were, were in the Discord. And, and by the end of that week, I think we were over 20,000 people all coming together. And just seeing the sort of the energy and also obviously then all people pulling together various kind of efforts to make this come to life. We didn't end up buying it, I should say as well, because someone outbid us, but, but just seeing this like massive energy, pull, everyone pulling into one uh, sort of unifying project. I, I think I haven't been part of that in, in sort of in the last 10 years, that kind of tremendous sort of startup energy, whatever you might call it. And I mean, it was all organized obviously by a few people at start, but then eventually, I mean, when you reach a certain point, you have all these kinds of um, responsibilities and all the kind of knowledge in your group. So, I mean, everyone pulled their weight and everyone chimed in where they could chime in. If it was just retweeting, that was still just retweeting. It was spreading the word. So, I mean, it's it was quite marvelous, marvelous to see, uh, marvelous to see everything coming together in this. Like, we haven't we hadn't worked together at all before. I I, I know a handful of people, but. Most of them I've never met, but still everyone was helpful and friendly. But obviously uh, talking about what you set out to achieve, I mean, this was a super clear goal. It was so clearly defined, like we need to raise money. That's what we need to do. It was a complex way to get there, but still a quite easy sort of target to, to go to. And I mean, I've been part of a few now, the DAOs, uh, to various extents. And successful go DAOs, in my view, they have a clear goal or vision. And they are jumpstart by individuals, but participants can steer decisions. So it's really important that you leave the autonomy and, and decision making to the group. So you don't do like uh, firm decisions from the top. Uh, 
and they have a super high level of transparency. So everyone knows all the time what's going on. Documents are openly shared and, and yeah, there's no secrets around the, an organization. And it also re finds a way to reward meaningful contribution. So you get the reward for, for doing good stuff that's in the interest of DAOs. And I said they run on smart contracts, so that's usually very clearly defined. This is what you need to contribute. And why do I bring this up at all? Because I think, I mean, if you look at this list, this is, I mean, going back to my work as, as working in HR, I think this hits all the box almost for what I'm trying to achieve with organizations I work with. Like you, you need to have this in place in organizations in general, I would say. But it's so clear that now when people sort of self-organize and when you have this sort of decentralized model and which is also running on technology, then it's, it's easier to get this in place to some extent. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but it's like when there's a sort of almost mathematical precision behind it, one could argue that, oh, it's quite boring, but it's not. I mean, it's, it's very clear that if you contribute, if you do this, this and that, that contributes to the clear goal and vision that you have, you'll get rewarded. Like, and I mean, it's, it's, I, I mentioned this because this is what you are competing against to a larger extent. I mean, it's not super coming yet. I, I, mean, I don't think you will go out of business if you don't do, if you don't sort of transform your organization into a DAO tomorrow. But I think to a large extent, this is what you're competing against on the open market. Because I mean, if I were an engineer, I would definitely look at DAOs of a way of making a living today because you, you, you actually get cash. You can get cash rewards for this, which is quite high. And you know exactly what you need to achieve in order to get those rewards as well. And I mean, if we are, if I look at myself, I mean, there's always ambiguity in the organizations on, okay, what do I need to do to impact my comp and whatnot? Well, all of a sudden you have a way to impact your comp, which you know exactly how to impact it and, and what to do as well. So it's always good to know that this is coming. And, and, and I mean, if, if, you, if you are sort of torn between two fences as an engineer, I mean, why not choose uh, something where you all, you're not, uh, you're rewarded fairly, you know exactly what your reward will be, and you can also influence and impact the organization of the whole organization. So, I mean, the, the, you have an impact as well. It's not only that you get perhaps a higher cash reward, you get impact into what the organization will do as well. So it's good to know that this is what you're competing against. And I think this will, in the long run, I, once again, I don't think like short term, this won't be a thing. Like you, you can rest assured that, I mean, you don't have to switch to a DAO tomorrow, but long term, if we look long term, I think you will need to take this in consideration because I think this will be a thing. I think more and more organizations, or there will be more and more organizations spun up this way. So the next big startups will, perhaps some of them will be a DAO and they will attract a certain uh, amount of people and they will attract people based on the principles that they're running. So we need to do better in our organizations in order to attract talent and to have talent that are sort of willing to, to do the work that we need them to do. So it's, it's forcing us to up our game, which is not necessarily bad, but once again, it's a bit long-term, but why not start now? I mean, we all could benefit from making our vision and goals and a bit, stuff like that a bit clearer. And also I think the transparency component, I think that is still hugely sort of underestimated the impact that might have. Like people want to be part of organizations where they have transparency, where they have uh, autonomy of, for sure, but also the impact to influence, okay, where are we going with this? When any, they want autonomy and, and ability to impact their day. So once again, short term, probably fine. Long term might be something to consider. So let's summarize. I hope you've now sort of learned then what, what is a DAO, what is an NFT, what is blockchain, what is Web3.0. I hope you got some inspiration of, okay, this is where we might be heading. As said, it's far out. It's, I mean, <laughs> most of you are, will not do NFTs tomorrow, I'm pretty sure. But it's, it's, a, it's a look into the future, what the future might be. And as I said, I might be totally wrong. But then we can all laugh about that in five years or so. Uh, so <laughs> and, and, and that's totally fine as well. But I think uh, I wanted to, to show that, hey, this, this is a possible future. 
a possible future beyond the old sort of, I, I wouldn't say, I, I shouldn't say boring, uh, other sort of future trends that you see. I wanted to go out and limb and, and really sort of try to push the envelope a bit around this. Um, but I hope you, you found it at least somewhat useful and that you, you have some new thoughts. Uh, and as I said, don't panic over this. Like it, you won't be out of a job tomorrow. Your organization will still be around even if you don't shift to a DAO or even if you don't use NFTs as a reward mechanism probably for a long time. But now at least you know what it is and then you can take more and better decisions around if for example a vendor comes up which i've seen actually and if people are now turning to companies say hey we can make nfts for you as a reward mechanism so if someone pops up in your or your inbox either you can take the meeting and hear them out but you also know what you're saying yes or no to if they pop up so that was the aim for this session to educate you a bit hopefully and hopefully i made i made sense of it uh, and uh, i say thank you and should you have any questions once again pop them in the comment field i can answer them later i don't know if there are comments i don't see them if, if there are comments if there are no comments then there's no comments and if you have any other questions reach out i'm on linkedin uh, johannes Sundlu, obviously and yeah i'll i'll see you I'll see you next time I do a webinar, I guess, <laughs> or I hope. Take care.